right, so I want to switch um, themes a little bit to talk about reputation systems and identity systems. It is something that is growing. There's energy going into it. Core internet developers had a, a uh, workshop, I think, in Philadelphia about developing the web of trust, reputation, identity system. I wrote an article about how to not build an Orwellian reputation system. And um, you have a particular uh, perspective on, on reputation systems that are is interesting. And I, I have some, some, some skepticism, and I want to challenge you on it. But I do recognize the main point that you make, which is that if you build permanent record of people's past behavior, that, can, uh, that limits their capacity to change and grow, and uh, it can become a weapon to use against them. Now, do you have any, any thoughts to start up? Maybe you want to sort of... So I, I think the, the fascination with reputation is because in traditional finance we use reputation as a proxy to identifying the default risk associated with a specific identity and that's because identity is part of all financial transactions. The biggest problem I have with reputation is that it's not really what we're trying to establish. Reputation doesn't matter. What matters is default risk. What matters is if I make a transaction or enter a contract with someone, will they break that contract? Will they default on me? And am I facing a risk? And so to me, the most important thing is to address the risk of default rather than proxy that to say, well, I can identify the risk of default by looking at someone's identity and then through that look at the reputation and through that assume that past behavior will give me some insight into future behavior. That's three steps removed from what you're trying to achieve and it's very vague. Um, and so the reason I don't think reputation systems work is because they're a relic of traditional financial systems that need reputation because they don't have better ways of managing default risk. Whereas in Bitcoin, we have better ways of managing default risk. We can use smart contracts. We can use multi-sig. We can use uh, escrow. We can use a whole load of uh, tools to address the primary issue, which is default risk. And then if you can do that without reputation, then you can do it anonymously. So now you can address the default risk while dealing with anonymous parties without having to establish trust first of all, which is the true principle of Bitcoin. And I think it's really important to be able to do anonymity in transactions and remove the default risk without having to attach reputation and identity. So I'm very skeptical of reputation and identity because I think as a social construct it depends on memory, the ability to forget, as well as locality, the, the fact that you know the reputation of the people in your immediate vicinity but it isn't globally scaled. And if you turn a system of reputation into something that is both global and in infinite time, forever, global and forever, um, then it, it doesn't work. Not only does it work, it becomes a, a dystopian nightmare. Um, it, it ignores the possibility for people to change. And, and it's, I, I think the ability of, uh, of humans to change their behavior over time um, is, is a redeeming quality of, of the human species. And if you create reputation systems that lock you into what you did before and preclude the ability to change, you're, you're removing something that is inherently human by mechanizing this, um, th this characteristic. And, and that's why I'm extremely skeptical of, of reputation systems. I think they're solving the wrong problem. The real problem we want to solve is default risk. Yeah, I, my understanding of the, the, the source of reputation, uh, to give a little bit of context, is that we evolved within small tribes of 150 people or so. We have this thing called the Dunbar number. We can't remember more than 150 people, more or less. And so there was a, with that kind of, and in small tribes, there's deep interconnection between people. So it would be really hard to cheat and the, the, neg the negative consequences were immediate. We don't have that on the internet. We don't have that online. And that's um, a good thing. No, I mean, see, the thing is, I think that's a good thing because if you've lived in a small town, and I, when I grew up in Greece, I, I spent a lot of time at my, at my dad's village, right? And I lived in a small town where not only did I know everybody and everybody knew me, but they knew me as Andreas the son of, right? And they knew me as part of my family tree. What that does is it creates an environment that is actually quite oppressive. It doesn't allow you to take risk because if you fail, that failure reflects on your entire family and then is carried with you through your reputation. One of the things that I love about living in a city or living in a, in a, in a country that doesn't have, you know, these very strong familial ties and, um, you know, 
uh, generations of reputation and, and things like that is that it gives people the opportunity to take much more risk and to reinvent themselves. And, and societies that have that become much more vibrant societies, whereas societies that have um, you know, very strong family bonds, very strong historical things, what happens is people end up entering life at the position of their family, and then they can't move, right? They can't choose what they're going to be in society. It keeps them captive in the history of their family. Um, and so you see these, these uh, societies become stratified. The class distinctions become solidified, right? Um, and you are born into a caste or a class, and you stay in that class. Whereas the most vibrant societies are the ones that allow anonymity, that allow people to be someone today and then reinvent themselves and be someone completely different, to take risks. And if something goes wrong, they pay a short-term price and then reinvent themselves. That is a huge source of innovation and freedom and flexibility in a society. So I don't think the idea is uh, the internet doesn't have the reputation of a small village. Well, that's a great thing. That's freedom. And if we did have the internet have the reputation of a small village, it would be a stifling and oppressive place. I certainly don't think that reputation systems should be based on any kind of biometric information or personal information. It should be some, a kind of pseudonymous nickname type of system if they were to, to be. It's hard for me to argue with what you're saying. Um, how do you look at environments like, or market demand for, say, loans, right? Especially something like Bitcoin loans, where there's significant risk of default, and right now it's being built around social media and stuff like that. Do investors just need to accept the fact that they are, say, they could lose their money and there's not much they can do about it? I think the real issue with loans is concentration of risk. It's not the uh, individual default risk. It's the concentration of risk. If if I have a, a loan, for example, that I'm using a, a social media lending platform to loan out money to 2,000 farmers, uh, I use uh, Kiva, uh, which is one of those platforms, and Lending Club. Now, I'm one investor out of thousands, and my portfolio consists of thousands of loans, not a lot of money, like... Two dollars, five dollars per loan, right? And so I have a default rate that's like 10 percent, uh, which would be high in any other environment. I don't care. I don't care because it's spread along so many investors, and my portfolio is so diversified that I don't have concentration of risk, and I can take that risk because for all of the bad performing loans, I have so many more that are good. And so I don't need to worry about collateralizing or reputation or any of those things. I can do the lending function simply by massively diversifying risk. In fact, reputation and identity force you to reduce economic inclusion. Um, because one of the biggest barriers for people to enter the financial system is the lack of collateral and the lack of reputational metrics. So they're excluded from the financial system completely. Whereas with anonymity and massive diversification of lending, uh, you can now do a lot more inclusions. Reputation to me is a huge barrier to global economic inclusion. Yeah, it needs to have a barrier to enter or else the, there's no cost to create an identity and then potentially defrauding somebody else. Um, I, I have a hard time arguing with that, so we can maybe leave it at that. I have to go. Is there anything else you'd like to mention before we go? No, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Hello, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. If this is the kind of topics that you're interested in, the kind of people that you're interested in, then I really suggest you check out Anarchapulco 2016. It's the largest our capitalist conference in the world and it's going to be jam-packed with cyberpunks entrepreneurs journalists and uh, activists people trying to change the world through enterprise last year it was fantastic and uh, this year we have an incredible speaker list uh, among them trace mayer Doug Casey, Roger Ver, Adam Kokesh, Dana Martin, Skinner Lane, Walter Block and the list goes on and on if you are on the fence about it, you can get 10% off if you use the discount code DISRUPTTECH. It only lasts till the end of 2015 though, so get it while it's hot. And, uh, you know, I hope to see you there. Uh, take a week off, escape the winter, come join 
the warmth and the good company here in Acapulco for a few days. And if you really like it, you might want to stay. A few of us have already done that. Anyways, enjoy whatever you're doing. And uh, before you go, check out this video right here. It is fantastic. This is the video, the next video you need to see. All right. Thank you. Peace out. Subscribe and uh, have a good day.